Good evening and thank you for coming. Over the years, it has been the privilege of this university's Committee on Pre-Legal Education, in company with the Lectures Committee and with general finan generous financial assistance from the government of the student body, to bring to this campus a number of outstanding scholars and practitioners in American jurisprudence from the bench, the bar, and the academy. But the university has perhaps never been so privileged in these Law Day lectures as it is this evening. With respect both to the intrinsic qualities and charm of our guest and to the remarkable timeliness of his visit. Were this merely a meeting of academics who labor in constitutional law and history and theory, our guest's official title would, in and of itself, stand as introduction enough. For Mr. Berger is Charles Warren, Senior Fellow in American Legal History at Harvard, a position whose name commemorates the work of a distinguished scholar of the Supreme Court of a previous generation and whose name is virtually synonymous with excellence in the writing of legal history. But Mr. Berger is a good deal more than the title. His story is the story of a scholar who developed an interest out of sheer curiosity in a long neglected set of problems which appeared to him to be worth the investigation but which required voluminous basic research. He undertook his work on executive privilege without a precise notion of when it might be employed by the public at large. And the drama of his story arises in the fact that his work reached fruition at precisely the time when there developed a desperate national need for it. The story of that work is his own to tell, but it should be observed that the field of the separation of powers has virtually no intellectual boundaries or boundaries in scope or time. And for those of you who have not had the opportunity to examine Mr. Berger's work, the scholarship is simply overwhelming. Starting with at least four centuries of British parliamentary history, and proceeding through the entire fabric of American constitutional law and history. As Professor Berger himself pointed out to a joint meeting of three Senate subcommittees investigating the matter of executive privilege on April 10th of last year, the material to use language employed by lawyers simply cannot be nutshelled. Professor Berger's researches have produced the first three volumes of the Harvard Studies in Legal History, as well as a portion of his prodigious record of some 35 law review articles. The first of these books is a definitive study of the relationships between Congress and the Supreme Court, which was published in 1969 and is standard in the field. Of that volume, another distinguished observer of the court, Alpheus Thomas Mason of Princeton, himself the biographer of Louis Brandeis, has written, quote, this reviewer feels too much indebted for the rewards Mr. Berger's book offers to do more than express unbounded admiration. Mr. Berger's second volume, an exhaustive study on impeachment, was published last year, established itself immediately as the standard in the field, and is reported to be the most widely read book this year in the halls of Congress. It has also probably been given more than passing notice by the federal judiciary. His third volume, Executive Privilege, A Constitutional Myth, has been published just this month and exposes as a mere tissue the notion that such secrecy can be justified. That record alone speaks for itself. But some funny things happened to Mr. Berger on his way to the Harvard University Press. The practical necessities of the time were becoming intensified. Among them were the widespread calling into question of the use of executive or the president's war making power during the administration of Lyndon Johnson, an impeachment effort directed at one Supreme Court justice in 1970, the concern developed almost too late 
by Congress and the public last year about the uses of secrecy and so-called executive privilege, and finally, the tragic crisis in which the nation is immersed at this moment. The need became apparent for the precedents, authorities, and analysis necessary as benchmarks to contemporary decisions. And there stood Professor Berger, nearly alone as the expert. He has been, to my knowledge, before a minimum of four full-blown congressional hearings on assorted aspects of the separation of powers, during some of which we have been privileged to hear his disarming candor through the blessing of National Public Radio. He has also appeared earlier this year on Bill Moyer's television documentary on impeachment and is the subject of a moving biographical article by Gary Wills in the current Atlantic Monthly. Professor Berger grew up in Chicago and lived all his early life in the Middle West. He is a graduate of the University of Cincinnati and the Northwestern Law School. He also holds a Master of Laws from Harvard. In the late 30s, he entered government service as an attorney in charge of appellate matters for the Securities and Exchange Commission, from which he moved to the Justice Department as a special assistant to the Attorney General, and from there to the positions of Associate General Counsel and then General Counsel to the Alien Property Custodian. Following the war, he entered private practice in Washington. In 1962, he was invited to Bolt Hall, the law school of the University of California, as a regent's professor. He remained there several years and then left to devote himself totally to study and writing. He has been a member of the American Law Institute, the Cosmos Club, and has served as chairman of the section on administrative law of the American Bar Association and as chairman of the ABA's special committee on special courts. It is difficult not to embarrass a man of these achievements when introducing him publicly, and I do not wish to do so. But one preeminent quality of Mr. Berger's work must be underlined. He is an implacable foe of governmental oppression and has been totally nonpartisan in his preference for the Constitution and democratic control of government ahead of any respect for incumbents of any political faith in any political office. He has not been an observer who has bent his interpretation of governmental power to his own or anybody else's view of public policy. It is a great pleasure to welcome Mr. Berger to a state whose people still hold in the main a high degree of the faith which is embodied in the state's motto, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. And it is an honor to present to this audience a gentleman who, by dint of sheer scholarly curiosity, is pointing some of the ways toward the continued actualization of that faith. Professor Raoul Berger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I get a very special thrill from appearing in this magnificent hall. It reminds me when I was a young man striving to be a violent virtuoso and what an exciting thing it was to stand up and look at a sea of faces, seats like this. I haven't been in an auditorium like this as a lawyer hitherto in my life, so this is a first for me. I'm especially glad to be here with you because when a man grows old, he likes to feel that what he has to say has some interest for you young people because the future lies in your hands. We live at a time of great constitutional problems, really of extraordinary proportion. We face 
a situation which is unprecedented. And I want to lead you down some of the paths that I dug over a period of about seven, six, seven years. And I'll start with a problem which is of the essence right now. Confident that you can understand fully everything I'm going to say to you. I'll start with what is the essence of high crimes and misdemeanors. That is the heart of the impeachment problem. The Constitution provides that the president may be removed for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The uninitiated would conclude at once that high crimes and misdemeanors just means misdemeanors that have been jacked up a trifle. <laughs> but that's not so. One need only remind you, for example, that the accident, the tree appears in shoe tree, doesn't mean they're related. Shoes don't grow on trees, trees don't grow in shoes. In the same way, there is almost as little relation between ordinary crimes and misdemeanors and high crimes and misdemeanors. The word high is a tip-off. Incidentally, high crimes and misdemeanors means high crimes and high misdemeanors, not as a matter of grammatical construction merely, but as a result of the historical materials. We know that the term high misdemeanor was applied to bribery, for example. There are a number of other historical data. High crimes and misdemeanors are a very peculiar kind of cat. They comprise as treason and bribery, the associated offenses would put you on notice. They comprise offenses against the state. Treason, for example, is betrayal of the state. They are tried by parliament under the law of parliament. So you have three criteria for a high crime and a high misdemeanor. It's an offense against the state, like treason or bribery, which corrupts the tissue of government. Tried by parliament under special parliamentary law. When the words high misdemeanors first occurred in an impeachment proceeding way back in 1386, there was no such crime as a misdemeanor. Without pausing to tell you about the development of it, we first find it in the law 150 years later. Now, ordinary crimes and misdemeanors are offenses against the person, like murder or rape, assault. They're tried by courts, not by parliament. And they're tried under the ordinary criminal law, not the parliamentary law. So those who look at high crimes and misdemeanors, like some whom I won't mention here, and conclude at once, well, it's just a crime and a misdemeanor, are wide of the mark. Moreover, it will not do to just stop with the words high crimes and misdemeanors, because the framers of the Constitution made a very important departure from English law. At English law, the trial for removal, that is to say impeachment, and the criminal offense were wedded in one proceeding. It resulted that a man could go to the gallows by the vote of the parliament, a political tribunal. The framers feared that. They divorced the removal proceeding from the criminal proceeding. So we've got two proceedings not one. To harp on the fact that at English law, high crimes and misdemeanors were criminal is to ignore the fact that there's a difference in this divorce between the removal proceeding and the subsequent or earlier indictment. There are two things on the face of the Constitution that compel us to read the removal proceeding 
Bear in mind that removal is just a prophylactic measure designed to clean the office of a man unworthy to occupy it. No other punishment, disqualification to hold further office. Now, if we read the removal proceeding as criminal in nature, we encounter the doctrine of double jeopardy, which means having been tried for one criminal offense, the offender cannot be tried a second time for another. It would follow that one who had been impeached could not be indicted, or a one who had not been indicted, who had been indicted could not be impeached. Similarly, the Sixth Amendment provides that in all criminal prosecutions, and they had deleted an earlier exception for impeachment, in all criminal prosecutions, trial shall be by jury. If impeachment is a criminal process, a criminal prosecution, it must be tried by jury. I may say to you that the presidential protagonists have resolutely averted their eyes from these two facts. They don't even look at this divorce between impeachment and indictment. When you look at the Constitution, you must always bear in mind that it was framed by men, first, many of whom had been trained as lawyers in the common law, the English law. Second, men who were intent on preserving English liberties, which had been enshrined in the common law. They therefore used common law terms in the Constitution as a sort of shorthand as the Supreme Court said, confident that they would be readily understood. Let me give you some examples. For example, the right to be freed from illegal detention is associated with the writ of habeas corpus. So there's just mention of the writ of habeas corpus, not of the whole body of law that turns on habeas corpus, that spells it out. They use the word bribery. They didn't stop to explain it because they knew one who read the word would realize that it had been brought over from English law and would look to English law for its content. In the same way, high crimes and misdemeanors were words that had been used in English law in these parliamentary trials. And they were, as a matter of fact, chosen by the framers because they thought that they had a limited technical meaning, a meaning that was well understood. Not only that, but in the course of their discussions in the several conventions, they adverted to the categories of high crimes and misdemeanors. Subversion of the Constitution, which means usurpation of power. Abuse of power. Betrayal of trust. Neglect of duty. These were all categories of high crimes and misdemeanors in English law which were expressly mentioned by the framers. So we know these were offenses that they intended to strike at to remove a man for. Now, it's quite true that the founders employed the criminal terminology of English law to describe the offense for which there would be a removal. But that shouldn't start us, first of all, they had no time to draft a brand new vocabulary. They wrote this extraordinary document in the space of 14 weeks, debating every word. But more important, to give you a homely example, supposing you were parked at an intersection where there's a red light, and somebody came barreling through at 80 miles an hour, destroyed your car, and injured you severely, you would have two remedies based on the very same facts. <clears throat> you could sue for damages in what lawyers call a tort action for negligent, for grossly negligent driving, and you could file a complaint with the district attorney to bring a criminal prosecution. Now, the fact that the same acts form the basis of a criminal prosecution do not transform your suit for damages a civil suit into a criminal action. In the same way, the fact that certain acts described as high crimes and misdemeanors 
can be prosecuted criminally. Mind you, not all of them. Because, for example, to this day, abuse of power has not been made a crime. So you can only remove for it. The fact that there is this description of some high crimes and misdemeanors in criminal law, too, doesn't change the civil nature of the removal proceeding. I hope you followed me on that. Now there's one further and riveting fact. You must understand that in making this argument that an indictable crime is required in order to remove the president, the presidential proponents seek to make removal as difficult as possible, virtually impossible. You must bear in mind that at federal law, there are no crimes except those which have been made crimes by statute unless there's a federal statute expressly declaring certain acts to be a crime, that act is not a crime. So you have this extraordinary consequence. Abuse of power, usurpation of power, neglect of duty, betrayal of trust, etc. the very offenses that were meant to be impeachable would, under this doctrine, not be impeachable because they have never been made crimes in all the years. Incidentally, which shows that Congress itself didn't think it necessary to make them crimes. And it's Congress that has the jurisdiction to impeach. And the point I'm making here was made by a great justice of the Supreme Court 140 years ago, Joseph Story, who said to insist on an indictable crime as the basis of impeachment is to enable every offender virtually to go scot-free. So I would say to you, emphatically, unhesitatingly, that the notion that an indictable crime is required as a basis for impeachment simply doesn't stand up. It's without historical basis. And I've had the great pleasure of devoting an article to it in the current issue of the Yale Law Journal, where I dissected very carefully St. Clair's argument to the contrary. Now, let me pause for a moment to deal with this plea of executive privilege to an impeachment inquiry. As you know, the House is given the sole power to impeach, the Senate the sole power to try an impeachment, and impeachment is simply an accusation. Articles of impeachment are very much like counts of an indictment. They'll be filed with the Senate, which will sit down as a court to try the case. So both the power of accusation and the power of trial are lodged in the Congress, not in the President. As a prelude to impeachment, it's simply common sense that you should inquire before you hang a man. And remember, this goes back to the early 17th century. As early as 1621, you'll find an inquiry as a prelude to impeachment. As I say, it's just ordinary common sense. And the notion, again, just applying common sense, because constitutional law really doesn't depart from common sense. You mustn't be afraid of the Constitution. You must look at it for yourself from time to time. Now, it is simply ridiculous that a person that's under investigation should be able to dictate the terms of the investigation. Think if you were a... <laughs> think if you were a small-town banker suspected of fraud, and the state banking commissioner sent a bank examiner, and the banker would soothingly meet the bank examiner at the door and say, now look, there's certain information here which I know is innocent. But if you read it, you'll misunderstand it. <laughs> or saying, now, look, all of the files are in the back room. They're steel files. If you'll tell me, using your x-ray eyes, looking through the steel, what's relevant, I'll let you have it. <laughs> now, I can tell you, I was for eight years with the government. 
in the Department of Justice too. A banker who would make that kind of an argument or an antitrust malefactor would be thrown out on his ear. In fact, you notice IBM just the other day was ordered by a court to turn over 700 documents. And no talk about a U-Haul truck, truck either. <laughs> so much for common sense. You must bear in mind that the power of impeachment was put into the Constitution with a high design. It exhibited extraordinary prevision. The framers were mortally fearful of executive power. They knew the insatiable greed for power of those in office. They were steeped in history, and in particularly English history. They knew that Stuart absolutism had been halted at a time when absolutism was sweeping across Europe like a tide, and it was halted by impeachment. So they wanted to continue impeachment. That was the purpose of it. And their wisdom is demonstrated today, because were it demonstrated, were the Senate to hold that the President was guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors, it would, in retrospect, be horrible to think that we should have been saddled with a President whom we had no power to oust. So I say to you, impeachment has served a great purpose. In fact, the House of Commons said in 1689, and Burke repeated it 100 years later, impeachment has been the chief instrument for the preservation of our liberties. Now then, this power, English history shows, was plenary, meaning comprehensive. There were no defenses to it. From time to time, the President wraps himself in the robe of the separation of powers, something I'll return to. But in the focus of impeachment, it simply won't hold water. When impeachment was proposed in the Federal Convention, Rufus King and Charles Pinckney objected that this would destroy the independence of the President, that it would violate the separation of powers. Notwithstanding, they were voted down eight to two, which is a resounding majority, for the reason, as Mason said, nothing is so important as to continue the power of impeachment. So the inescapable inference is that the separation of powers has no play where impeachment is concerned, that impeachment is a breach in the separation of powers, as, in fact, one of the outstanding founders later said in 1789. So I would say to you, it's the veriest smokescreen to invoke the separation of powers against the House Judiciary Committee in the process of an investigation. A, an investigation preliminary to an impeachment is a part of the impeachment. And there is, short of a plea of self-incrimination, there is no defense to the investigatory power. And the fact that the President lays claim to it doesn't mean that it exists, because he has laid claim to other powers. <laughs> Let me turn now to executive privilege. And I ran across what struck me as a lovely quotation from a great French philosopher. I think he was a 17th century philosopher, Blaise Pascal. He expressed the suspicion that men were living in perilous times when people are full of opinions and void of knowledge. Now, what I'm trying to do is to substitute some knowledge, very painfully acquired. It didn't fall into my mouth like a little robin. And I want to share it with you. And let me then turn to executive privilege. That phrase has very recent antecedents, about 1958. It's a technical term for a claim by the President of a right to withhold information from Congress. It 
it doesn't represent merely a jurisdictional squabble between Congress and the President that we can just walk by as if a man and wife were fighting. Not at all. We all have a stake in it because we can't afford as a democracy to be spoon-fed information by Big Brother, what he thinks is good for us. A democracy depends for its existence on a free flow of information. He who controls the flow of information controls our destinies. You need look no further than the escalation by stealth in Vietnam to learn that lesson. The fact is that executive privilege, root and branch, is, as George Ball, who was perhaps the most commonsensical and sober man advisor that Lyndon Johnson had as president, George Ball said, it's a constitutional myth without historical warrant. And I borrowed my title from him. And I've at least persuaded myself of the truth of his view. Extraordinary accretions have been added to the myth right under our nose. I wish I could take the time to tell you some of them because they truly are laughable. But they exhibit that power grows by what it feeds on, just like the appetite. And one reckless claim succeeds another as long as we're supine and acquiescent. The case for executive privilege is not built on any history of the Constitution. It's built on a number of post-constitutional assertions by presidents. And presidents cannot, by their assertions, conjure power out of thin air any more than they can lift themselves by their bootstraps. Now, before going back to some of this constitutional history, which I'm sure you'll understand, I want to read to you a magnificent statement that I'd almost be tempted to say if girls still made these old-fashioned mottos that you could hang on the wall, ought to hang over every bedroom, every bed. The Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, drafted by John Adams, provided a frequent recurrence to the fundamental principles of the Constitution is absolutely necessary to preserve the advantages of liberty and to maintain a free government. The people have a right to require of their lawgivers and magistrates an exact and constant observation of those principles. In a word, what we've got to do periodically is to scrape the varnish or to change the simile, scrape, scrape the barnacles off the good ship Constitution and see what it looks like. Let me start then with the decision of the Supreme Court in 1927 that explains the words legislative power in the Constitution. At the adoption of the Constitution, said the Supreme Court, it was established parliamentary practice to inquire into executive conduct. And when the framers, this was an attribute of the legislative power, said the court. And when the framers conferred the legislative power on the Congress, it carried that power of inquiry with it. So we have express recognition in the highest quarters of the power of inquiry. Presidential proponents have always argued, well, nothing is said in the Constitution about the power of inquiry. Why do you insist that the executive power must, we must show that there is constitutional warrant for the right to withhold? And the answer is not an exercise of logic, but that the Supreme Court expressly invoked legal history and English precedent for existence of the power of inquiry. And there is no English precedent 
for a right to withhold information from the Parliament. Now, that's an important thing to bear in mind. The power of Parliament sitting as an inquisitorial tribunal was identified as the grand inquest of the nation. And as a great English judge st stated in 1839, the commons, meaning the House of Commons, are not invested with more of power and dignity by their legislative character than by that which they bear as grand inquest of the nation. So the power of the grand inquest was an extraordinary power at the highest levels of government administration, high in the roster of parliamentary powers. Since the Supreme Court looked to English history, as it always does to find out the meaning, as a matter of fact, of our constitutional terms and institutions, I did the same. In a random sampling of about 10 periods in English parliamentary debates, which was a very laborious task, I found that beginning with impeachment, the power of inquiry spread across the board. It included inquiries into corruption, into a base for legislation, into execution of the laws, into conduct of the war, even foreign relations about which the president has wrapped a shroud of secrecy were not immune. The highest officers of the land responded to such inquiries. I found not a single instance, not one, in which a minister, let alone a subordinate, protested that there was no power of inquiry or that its scope was too broad. Indeed, the great English constitutional historian, Henry Hallam, said, speaking of the investigations of 1691, it is hardly worthwhile to enumerate later instances of exercising a right which had become indisputable and even before it rested on the basis of precedent, could not be reasonably denied to those who might legislate, remonstrate, and impeach. Observe, Hallam said, just as a matter of principle, those who have the powers of legislation, of chiding, and of impeaching must have the power of inquiry. Moreover, he said that no minister had ever disputed the power of Parliament to inquire, which confirmed I was happy to find my own, own research. It's a striking fact that no member of the Nixon and Eisenhower administrations where executive privilege had its rankest growth, I should stop and say, that even those presidential pseudo-precedents in the 19th century, which I wish I could take the time to dwell on because one takes malicious delight in exploding such balloons, even those amounted only to about eight in a period of 150 years and were largely concerned with saving some officer from infamy and, dis and disgrace for unproved charges like the raw files of the FBI today. In the 12 years of the Eisenhower and Nixon administrations before Watergate, there were upwards of 40 withholdings, formal withholdings, five times as much in 12 years as there had been in the preceding 150 years. Now, it's a striking fact that no member of the executive branch has ever cited any pre-1789, pre-Constitution precedent for executive withholding. And I stress that because the Constitution has to be construed in terms of what the words meant when they were being used, of what the institutions were at that time. But in any event, 
the practice of inquiry, as I say, to sum up on that score, knew no bounds. It had never encountered a denial by the executive of a right to inquire or to withhold any information. And it was that institution that was taken over. Now, in addition to the case that I told you about, there's several buttressing factors. First of all, in four or five of the conventions, reference was made to the function of the House of Representatives as the grand inquest of the nation, which demonstrates that they well knew what they were dealing with. And although other powers that were granted to Congress met criticism and objection, not a voice, a single voice was raised to object that the powers of Congress as grand inquest of the nation were too broad, too sweeping, had to be curtailed. They accepted the powers which were familiar to them and which, as a matter of fact, the great English justice said were without limit. It was for the House of Commons to decide what were the limits of the power of inquiry. If it decided that the public wheel required an inquiry of this range, that was the end of it. Not a voice was raised for the simple reason that as one who studies constitutional records speedily discerns, there was a very lively distrust of executive power, of monarchical power. In fact, when Hamilton was defending some of the presidential powers in the Federalist, he was at pains to downgrade, to deprecate the powers of the president. He said, calculating on the aversion of the people to this hated monster, monarchy, the Opponents of the Constitution are trying to make out the president as the progeny of this detested institution. And he said, not so. As commander in chief, for example, he's merely the first general. And so down the line, he just downgraded those powers. And this is expressive of the fact that the framers didn't place their trust in the president. Well, the very fact that when the chips were down, they gave the power to ousted from office to the Congress is ample testimony of that fact. Now let me turn to the separation of powers. The joker in the word separation, word separation of powers is separation. You've got to have something to separate. To dwell on the separation of powers is to beg the question, to assume the answer, to assume that the president has a power to withhold which must be guarded from encroachment by the Congress, because that's what the separation of powers means, as John Adams explained in the Massachusetts Constitution. Now, as I've pointed out historically, there was no executive power to withhold, so there's nothing to protect for the separation of powers to protect. Now I'll give you some confirmatory evidence. First of all, the high priest of the separation of powers was the great Frenchman, Montesquieu, who was endlessly cited in the several conventions. And he, who built his model of government on the British system, was familiar with it, said that the legislature must have the power to inquire into the execution of the laws and the conduct of the executive. So here is the foremost apostle of the, dip, of the separation of powers telling us that it doesn't apply to legislative inquiry. Even more striking. In 1789, which was the first Congress, the new government had taken office. A statute was enacted, the Act of 1789, which made it the duty of the Secretary of the Treasury to furnish to the either House of Congress upon request all information pertaining to his office. The first Congress, in which sat some 18 or 20 framers and ratifiers, enacted this statute. It had been drafted by Alexander Hamilton, who wrote the Federalist, it had been signed by George Washington, who was the presiding officer of the convention. Are we to conclude that Mr. Nixon knows better than the first Congress?
George Washington and Alexander Hamilton what the separation of powers means. I submit to you that the Act of 1789 constitutes the strongest evidence that the framers had no notion that the separation of powers would shield executive conduct from congressional inquiry. Now, I want to add one last thing. Secrecy was mentioned, is mentioned on the face of the Constitution only once. The House and the Senate are re required to keep journals and to publish them, except when they determine in the national interest that they must be kept secret. This provision encountered rough going. It aroused a storm of criticism. Men as illustrious as Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George Mason, James Wilson, a great architect of the Constitution, they all were united in criticism. Jefferson, uh, Henry called secrecy in government an abomination. Faced by this opposition, in the ratification conventions, where we have to bear in mind that some conventions, adoption was touch and go. There were hard fights to win adoption of the Constitution. The proponents of adoption explained, and I'll paraphrase the explanation of John Marshall, who later became the Chief Justice. He asked, would you have us declare war in the open fields? that this provision is designed merely to keep matters secret, disclosure of which would be perniciously fatal. So here's an express grant to the Congress of a right to keep things secret from the public, which was whittled down to keeping secret only matters, the disclosure of which would be perniciously faithful, fatal. And the president, to whom no such power at all is given, claims a right to withhold anything and everything. This is an institution, a claim of power that you want to familiarize yourself. I want to find here a statement by, yeah, James Wilson, which will enable me to end on a good note. James Wilson, later a justice of the Supreme Court, was second only to Madison as an architect of the Constitution. Washington said he was one of the strongest men in the convention, as indeed he was. Hark to what he wrote. He said, the House of Commons have checked the progress of arbitrary power and have supported with honor to themselves and with advantage to the nation the character of the grand inquisitors of the realm. The proudest ministers of the proudest monarchs have trembled at their censure and have appeared at the bar of the house to give an account of their conduct and ask pardon for their faults. And it was this grand inquest of the nation which the framers sought to preserve. Professor Berger, I think the reaction of this audience is sufficient to express 
our very great gratitude to you for coming to coming here and for sharing this with us. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the fun really starts. I was at dinner with Professor Berger and two lawyers, and he has graciously consented to answer your questions, and I can assure you the answers will be quick and searching because he revealed himself, at least to me at dinner, as not only a very great scholar, which he has shown here, but a first-class lawyer. If you will stand and ask the question, I will repeat it so all can hear and turn it over to Professor Berger. Back there. Yes, sir. Mr. Hutter. If I may paraphrase so that you may <laughs> so that you may all hear it, Professor Berger, are there any powers of judicial review over an impeachment proceeding? Apparently he was exposed to some law training too. I should say to the gentleman that Professor Goldberg and I uh, are in a minority of two or three. As a matter of fact, I devoted a chapter of my book to that very problem. And of course, I was pleased when I found that Justice Goldberg picked up the point. Let me explain why I arrived at that conclusion very quickly. We live under a government of limited powers, enumerated powers. That's why we have a written constitution. It delegates certain powers, only those, and it also makes certain prohibitions. And the courts were set up to police those boundaries. Now, if, as my own research led me to conclude, high crimes and misdemeanors was designed to have limited scope, namely the scope it had at the adoption of the constitution. And indeed, the framers were aware that the words had a limited technical meaning. If they were limited, it didn't make sense to me that here, where the Congress could shape the very pillars of the tripartite structure, there could be no judicial review if it acted outside of bounds. Now, there are some very formidable counter arguments which I faced up to and sought to meet. But here, as elsewhere, there are no easy answers. As in the Defunis case, there are conflicting pulls. Um, I've given you the government of limited powers, which necessitates policing by the courts. Against that, for example, just the other day, a reviewer said, what? After this whole agony is gone through and the Senate convicts, you'll then have to start all over again in the courts, and the people will be boiling. And that's no inconsiderable argument. But for me, my devotion to a government of laws, of due process, rises above that. The government, the people will just have to sweat it out, and we have to make sure that even the president has the right of the lowliest felon to be tried according to law. In the back, here, the hand up. I won't answer. 
unfortunately, we, they were probably well enough for the second time around. Did you hear the first? Yes. That was the first. He is being allowed to consider that. He's being allowed you, to you, uh, I, I didn't quite hear. Mr. Berger heard it. I did not. <laughs> well, obviously, it would be highly indiscreet, even though I'm the soul of indiscretion, <laughs> to give you my opinion of John Doerr, one way or the other. Now, as to Mr. St. Clair, he has already been authorized to participate in the investigatory hearing uh, subject to the rulings of the chairman. I may say it's, this is what lawyers call a matter of grace, a gift not constitutionally required. No, the Supreme Court has in fact held a few years ago that nobody has a right to uh, appear by counsel in an investigatory proceeding. So this is just a gift. Down here, sir. Does the congressional power to set the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, such as it is, permit Congress to preclude judicial review of an impeachment proceeding? It would have to do more than that because it would really have to deprive the inferior federal courts of jurisdiction to hear the case. And then the deprive the appellate court of its appellate jurisdiction, the Supreme Court. That's a good question. And Article Three, of course, as you probably know, gives the uh, Congress the power to make exceptions and regulations with respect to the appellate power. But the first book that I published in 69 dealt with that problem. And I'm convinced, and some of my confreres have been convinced, that it plainly wasn't designed for that purpose at all. Because just again, without going to the legal argument, that would be too lengthy. If, as is the conventional learning and generally agreed, the founders designed judicial review as an instrument to curb the excesses of Congress, it would make no sense to then say that Congress, if it's dissatisfied with having one of its excesses set aside, Congress could then deprive the court of the right to hear such cases. That's like chasing your tail around the stump. We've got to, we've got to attribute some common sense to the founders. If they meant the court to hold certain excesses unconstitutional, they meant to make them stick. Now, I have furnished the documentation for that, and when my first book goes in the paperback, I would adjure you to read it. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the question, as I understand it, concerns the relationship of the Irvin Committee to the Senate as jurors in a trial of impeachment. Is that your intent? The gentleman is referring to the well-known doctrine of disqualification for bias. but. I know of no case where a senator has disqualified himself for bias. I may s <laughs> I may say, in addition to the bias which uh, you would attribute to the members of the Watergate Committee, there are some dyed in the wool Republican senators who uh, have none to uh, skillfully conceal their bias in favor of the president. So it cuts both ways. In any event, what you're faced with here, I should say, first of all, that the Senate sits both as judge and jury, judge of the law, jury of the facts. We've got in the law what we call a doctrine of necessity. 
and you've got to regard this as a body. When there's no other tribunal to hear the case, you've got to take it as you find it. Back, Mr. Kerber. Say, will you say it again, George, please? Hmm. The gentleman cites a famous instance in which Andrew Jackson refused to carry out the executive portion of a mandate that arose by implication from a decision of the Supreme Court. Was he guilty of a high crime? Well, first of all, from my reading, historical reading, I've been led to believe that's apocryphal. It's a, it's a, it's a resounding remark, but Roger Tawney, who became chief, whom he appointed as chief justice and was in his cabinet, uh, denied that Jackson had ever made such a remark. But in any event, sir, we've got enough current uh, offenses without going out the hypotheticals in Jackson's time. 